Welcome to the last unit of the semester, and I will say that both the Restoration and the 18th century have enough going on during them. They could probably be taught as an individual semester and still not cover everything. So we are going to move quickly through this period, um, and we're going to hit some of the key highlights, but there's a lot of depth that we won't really get to discuss, so hopefully you can um, do some exploring on your own. So in general, this is a period that has a lot of changes in just one chunk, um, which is why, like I said, we could do a whole semester on just this. Um, in 1707, the Act of Union brings Scotland um, into the English and Wales fold. So like it was England and Wales, and then Scotland was doing its thing. Um, 1707, it's pulled in, and now we have the United Kingdom. So the Act of Unity does that. Um, there's a lot of commercial vigor, um, which is great. Where they're growing globally in terms of economics. Um, they are achieving political stability after our civil war. You know, that left everything up in the air and pretty like nerve wracking for them. And they're also keeping an agricultural lifestyle, but cities are changing drastically and are moving to a more industrial kind of view. Um, in this period alone, the population of the country is going to double and reach 10 million. And so a lot of people are moving to those cities. Um, because of this, civil so society starts developing. So public institutions that we take for granted as always existing um, kind of develop. Printed works are going to become very popular. Um, they're going to also cover a wide range of scope and interest, inclusions of different types of things and people. Um, there's going to be a new domestic travel system, um, so trade industry also is going to be with that. And we also start seeing some new social standards where being polite um, is like the standard, your level of politeness, but it also means that you can differentiate between different social classes based off the politeness or like what training they've had, which is um, going to create some tensions, as you can imagine. So. In our historical focus, there's a lot. We're going to run through the period um, the best we can. So we start with the Restoration, 1660. Charles II is brought back. He's put back onto the throne. The monarchy is restored. Um, and the idea is that he has the he represents the hope of uniting the entire nation. Um, and it also pushes England back into the European orbit. And there's going to be a heavy French influence on England again. Think back to the beginning of um, the Middle Ages where we talk about how French had a heavy influence. Well, we've cycled back to that because Charles II um, was living in France at the time. Um, so he brings some of that influence, but it's going to have a British flair. Charles II makes wise decisions, but he is very frivolous with money. Um, and he also tries to pull all the power back into royalty, which we know is not going to go well um, because... That's what led to the Civil War. Um, he is, you know, he has Catholic sympathies. Um, he dissolved Parliament at one point by um, when they were going to push through a bill that he didn't like. So he just says, all right, we're going to get rid of it, which didn't, then develops the two political parties that they have today, the Tories and the Whigs. Um, so, again, he makes some good decisions, but he also has some moments where he's like his um, father and grandfather and great-grandfather. In 1665, we are going to have the bubonic plague come back, so that's a chaotic moment for everybody. By 1666, um, there's what's called the Great Fire, and this is a four-day fire in London, and it destroys a significant part of London and really changes that landscape. In 1673, the Test Act is enacted. This means that to be a civil and civil authority or military officer, you had to take the Anglican sacraments. Um, so you had to be Anglican. You couldn't be Catholic and you couldn't be any form, other form of Protestants, um, which means they're now barred from any form of public life. Um, they can't access upper education. By 1685, James II ascends. He is not liked by anybody. He has no support from anyone. Um, he is very loyal to the Catholic and he doesn't try to hide it like Charles II did. And he fills his court and he fills the government with Catholics, which you know, kind of goes against that test act. Um, and he is going back to the way it was. He wants to be um, absolute power for the royalty. And then he has a son, which it makes everyone scared that we're going to have another Catholic dynasty. Um, so what happens is in 1608, we have the Glorious or the Bloodless Revolution. Um, William of Orange and who's the husband of James II's daughter, Mary, they do a um, relatively 
bloodless revolution that exiles James II and allows them to keep a Protestant ruler. So Mary, who's James II's daughter, and her husband basically force her father out, and they take over and start ruling. Um, and this is when we really feel that everything stabilizes politically, um, and the country is unified together again. Um, and it also gives, you know, this idea that, hey, we can have big changes, we can have revolution, but it doesn't have to be bloody and it doesn't have to be violent, which is going to be important if you continue on to Bertlet too. So under William and Mary, you have the 1688 Toleration Act, which allows some um, freedoms to dissenters who also other Protestants who aren't Anglican, um, if they swear allegiance to the crown. However, Catholics and Jews are left out of that. So they're still kind of like out of luck. Um, 1689, you get the Bill of Rights, which revokes some of the actions James II took and limits the powers of the crown again. 1701 is that act of settlement. Um, so this um, fixes the succession problem and the worry everyone had about a Catholic dynasty. Um, all British sovereigns must be Protestant from there on. In 1702, um, Mary's going to die, so her sister Anne takes over. Her reign, um, you know, there's not a lot to say for me about Anne, except for the fact that this is the War of Spanish Succession. Um, so during this war, England um, defeats France and Spain, so they gain some new colonies. They um, gain the sales agreement with Spain over slaves. Um, so they're going to be the ones to sell slaves to the Spanish Empire. It also helps weaken some of England's commercial rivals, so that's how they can keep growing and getting stronger. Um, during this war, the Whigs and the Duke of Marlborough do try to remove the Test Act to allow more freedoms for people. However, Whig says nope and kicks um, the whole Whig party out of political office and so allows the Tory ministry to rise. And dies. Um, George I comes to the throne. He's the first Hanoverian king. He's going to rule until 1727. However, as in a general rule, the Hanoverian kings, so George I, George II, George III, um, are pretty, well, George I and George II are definitely disconnected. So Parliament pulls um, that power back to them. Um, which is why in 1720 you have what's considered the first prime minister in Robert Walpole, and he becomes very popular. Um, there was a stock market crash that he helps kind of keep the country running through. He juggles money really well. Um, and so people at first are like, yes, we like him. However, he does establish the patronage system, which means you can get um, governmental favors and governmental control um, through providing financial favors back to the government. However, the Tories don't like this because they want to move away from a corrupt government, away from the wealthy, and just be politically fair, which probably can sound, you know, that continues to be a problem. So this wasn't something that Walpole's alone in, um, but he does establish that system that allows it to kind of go on. Um, Walpole does um, refuse to go to war again against French, uh, France and Spain. Um, in 1742, so he falls out of favor. He had been going that way. Um, and is su succeeded by William Pitt the Elder. He's going to appeal to everyone's patriotism and be like, yes, England, we're the best. He's going to expand power and commerce overseas. Um, so that's, you know, con England, you can see, is continued to grow. The United Kingdom is doing well. 1745, um, the last Jacobite rebellion is also squashed. So like Scotland is subdued. Um, it has a huge impact on Scotland, and unfortunately, we're really not going to get to go into that much. Um, George III comes into the throne in 1716. You might know him from a very popular play um, in which he sings about how it might be nice um, for the colonies, you know, and they'll be back. Um, so George III comes over. He wants to see Britain as a colonial power, and he makes some new social... Um, orders based on liberty and radical reform. So people want to see um, more reforms and he really wants Britain to become a colonial power. In 1763, there's the Peace of Paris, which consolidates British power over Canada and India. So we're growing there. Um, you know, in 1765, the American Revolution, I don't have to say much about that. Um, but George is also having discontent at home. Wealth is highly concentrated, but the old social hierarchy is breaking down. Um, 
And now we're looking at money as a reason to respect people, not what your social standing was. I'm not saying that that social standing is going to go away. It will continue on for centuries, but it's starting the process of breaking down. In 1780, you have the Gordon riots in London. Um, they're held, London's held by mob rule because it's an anti-Catholic riot, um, which is impacting some discontent. And we just want to have public reform. We want a political republic, things to be better. Um, um, and as things are spinning, George III um, has some kind of illness and he starts having uh, moments of insanity and it lasts him until the end of his reigns. And so people kind of like don't know what to do with him because he's mentally breaking down on them, but he's their king. Um, so this end of the period has a lot of conflict between loyalty to old traditions, um, loyalty the, to the subordination, mutual obligations in terms of like the chain of being, um, and, you know, being self-sufficient, but they also really want a new society based on liberty, reason, and human rights. So there's a lot of conflict and pulling back and forth that we can see in the literature and what's happening socially I and mean, historically at this time. 